So um, let me begin with a recommendation because um, in some sense to get to know somebody as a preacher, you really need to read not just one sermon of theirs, but multiple sermons of theirs. And Luther was um, a pretty prolific preacher, even though um, he was a university professor. He preached quite a lot, uh, both uh, in the castle church and in the city church in Wittenberg, often filling in for um, some of his colleagues who had to be away. Uh, and uh, at that time, there were several opportunities for preaching uh, during Sunday and also on weekdays. So uh, this said, there is just an enormous volume of Luther's sermons. Um, a number of postils, if that word is unfamiliar to you, a postil is a sermon collection. Um, and those postils began to appear, uh, if you sort of think of the, of the timeline here, uh, 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1517, uh, as, uh, you know, the moment where Luther sort of publishes his protest against the sale of indulgences, by 1523, there is already a full hymnal that is in print. So, uh, so Luther and his colleagues are very prolific in terms of how to uh, uh, spread the gospel, uh, spread it in song, but then also spread it in uh, sermon. So those postals also come from very early uh, on in the 1520s, and there are, like I said, uh, volumes upon volumes of uh, Luther uh, sermons. If you want a good place to start, there is a small volume uh, uh, that is called Martin Luther's Christmas Book that was edited by Roland Bainton. And I think that's a good entry point into Luther's preaching, uh, Luther's Christmas preaching. We're on the, uh, on the eve of Advent almost, so, uh, and I have that, uh, that listed for you in the further reading section of this, um, of this handout. But let me begin at the beginning uh, and say something about how Luther understood preaching and what were the theological foundations of what it meant to preach? And then we will read just a couple of excerpts from uh, one of Luther's sermons to see how uh, he sort of did it in action, if you like. So Luther's Reformation, as one interpreter said, was in its essential nature nothing else but a rediscovery of the gospel. Now, for us to understand what it meant for Luther to rediscover the gospel, we have to understand, in a sense, the context in which that gospel was obscured, and then perhaps we'll get a sense of how Luther understood the gospel. I think we all use the word gospel, but perhaps um, there are slight inflections in that word, and it might mean sort of different things to, uh, to, uh, uh, to um, many among us, or slightly different things. So, um, so let's begin with that. I'm going to read uh, something that is also on your handout. This is a, an autobiographical piece that Luther wrote one year before his death in 1545 in the, in the uh, preface to his Latin writings, which began to appear in his own uh, lifetime, uh, uh, his collected Latin writings. And uh, in that 1545 piece, Luther reflects on what he, from that vantage point, understood as his theological breakthrough. So this is what he says. Meanwhile, I had already during that year, that is 1518, returned to interpret the Psalter anew. Luther was a professor of the Old Testament, and he um, uh, lectured on the Old Testament uh, quite prolifically. So he had come to interpret the Psalter anew. I had confidence in the fact that I was more skillful after I had lectured in the university on St. Paul's epistles. I had indeed been captivated with an extraordinary ardor for understanding Paul in the epistle to the Romans. But up till then, it was not the cold blood about the heart, but a single word in chapter 1, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, that had stood in my way. For I hated that word, righteousness of God, which according to the use and custom of all the teachers, I had been taught to understand philosophically regarding the formal or active righteousness, as they called it, with which God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. 
I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners, and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God and said, as if indeed it is not enough that miserable sinners, eternally lost through original sin, are crushed by every kind of calamity by the law of the Decalogue, without having God add pain to pain by the gospel, and also by the gospel threatening us with His righteousness and wrath. Thus, I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. Nevertheless, I beat importunately upon Paul at that place, most ardently desiring to know what St. Paul wanted. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning, and this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. There a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. Thereupon I ran through the scriptures from memory. I also found in other terms an analogy as the work of God, that is what God does in us, the power of God, with which He makes us strong, the wisdom of God, with which He makes us wise, the strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. And I extolled my sweetest word with a love as great as the hatred with which I had before hated the word righteousness of God. Thus, that place in Paul was for me truly the gate to paradise. So, looking at this text, this autobiographical reflection that Luther gives us, let us ask again, what did Luther discover? The word gospel had been part of his vocabulary, and it is, yet it is pretty clear that he believes he totally misunderstood what the gospel was. So what did he discover? What is the gospel that Luther discovered? What we can see in the young Luther, as he reflects on himself, is that he has a picture of God, a certain picture of God, um, God as fundamentally righteous. Um, but what does that mean? It means that God is endowed with certain attributes that are suitable to Him, and in comparison with which we are shown to be only creatures who cannot measure up, not as a sinner. Um, and certainly not even as a human being. God is, you might say, wholly other. He possesses certain attributes which are not ours, and in relation to God, not even as sinners, but simply as human beings, we must feel very tiny and very small and very unrighteous um, indeed. See, Luther, talks, Luther says about himself, he says, I lived as a monk above reproach. Uh, and yet he thought, even as a monk above reproach, he did not quite measure up. What Luther identifies as the problem in the piety of his own day is, first of all, that this kind of understanding of God, he believes, is too philosophical. Uh, it's a certain construction. Uh, this is what God must be like in contradistinction from us. He is righteous, we are miserable uh, sinners, and certainly unrighteous. But I think even more fundamentally, what Luther identified as the problem with that kind of piety was that when God is portrayed in that kind of a way, or when God is allowed to be portrayed in that kind of a way, every thought of God becomes ultimately a thought about me. God is sort of a vanishing point, because if I cannot measure up I am constantly preoccupied with myself. And you can see um, 
that that was really a real concern already in the indulgence con controversy um, in 1517. People, uh, at least some people, uh, did think that, did not that, they, that they did not measure up, that they could not possibly measure up, and therefore they secured for themselves indulgence letters uh, to uh, provide some kind of relief um, from all the um, from all the working, which was still not enough. Later on in the bondage of the will in, in 1525, Luther will call um, the Christians of his own day temerarious operators, uh, reckless workers um, uh, from the Latin. Uh, people were almost, I mean, it's almost like to sort of update the image, almost like energizer bunnies, um, uh, sort of preoccupied with themselves, but thinking of God only in such a way that ultimately every thought of God became a concern um, about yourself. So what Luther ultimately comes to discover through his study of the scriptures, his meditation of the scriptures, his wrestling with the scriptures, it's not that the Bible sort of becomes an open book to him like uh, the moment he opens it. He says he had lectured on the Psalms already and, and had really been a professor of, of, of biblical studies for quite a while, and still he doesn't believe that he, he, that he got it quite right. Um, he comes to an understanding that God should be understood not philosophically, however dignified that philosophical idea of God is, but rather we must understand God as He works, as He discloses Himself to us in His own work. And Luther wants us to be preoccupied not with ourselves, but with God. He wants us to pay attention. Look at what God is doing, not at how you might imagine God, not how God is portrayed to you, but look, sort of, look at what God is doing. Luther wants us to pay attention, to be captivated, uh, fixated on God, to fix our eyes um, on Jesus, ultimately, because uh, ultimately it is in Christ that that work of God is disclosed. And he wants us to understand God in opposition to that philosophical notion where God is wholly different from us. He wants us to understand God as the giver of all that is good. God is the giver of all good gifts, including Himself. God gives His very self and His very heart to us. And therefore, the attributes of God are not the kind of attributes which God possesses imminently, to which we then need to measure up, or in face of which we, th we feel very small. The attributes of God are those kind of characteristics which God actually shares with us. The righteousness of God is not that which puts us in place and puts us down, but the righteousness of God is that by means of which God makes us righteous. God is unstinting in His self-giving. So Luther wants us to pay attention to God's work, and especially to God's work in Christ. But even here, we must be very careful. Uh, so it's not a philosophical idea of God, not, not what we imagine God to be. Uh, it's His work in Christ, but even here, Let's be careful how the work of God in Christ is to be understood. Luther says, first of all, we can look at Christ as an example. And we can certainly preach Christ in that kind of a way. This is what he has to say about Christ as example. You should grasp Christ, His words, works, and sufferings in a twofold manner. First, as an example that is presented to you, which you should follow and imitate. Thus, when you see how he prays, fasts, helps people, and shows them love, so also you should do, both for yourself and for your neighbor. However, this is the smallest part of the gospel, Luther says, on the basis of which it cannot yet even be called gospel. For on this level, and now pay attention, Christ is of no more help to you than some other saint. His life remains his own, and he does not yet contribute anything to you. He's just a model, but then so could, uh, you know, so could uh, Gandhi be, or somebody else who lives an exemplary life. Um, in this uh, short, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, he, his life remains his own and does, uh, does not yet contribute anything to you. In short, this mode of understanding Christ does not make Christians, Luther says, but only hypocrites. Uh, you must grasp, grasp Christ at a much higher level. So we can follow in the footsteps of Christ and imitate Christ, but that is certainly the smallest part of the gospel, uh, if it is really the gospel at all. For Luther, God's work in Christ has 
First and foremost, the characteristic of gift. And here you can see that this sort of notion of God as giving himself is really fleshed out Christologically. It's not that God sort of abstractly gives himself. No, he gives himself to us in Christ. And Christ must first, first be understood as gift before we present him to people as an example. So this is what Luther says. Um, before you take Christ as an example, you accept and recognize him as a gift, a, as a present that God has given you, and that is your own, that truly belongs to you. This means that when you see or hear of Christ doing or suffering something, you do not doubt that Christ himself, with his deeds and suffering, belongs to you. On this you may depend as surely as if you had done it yourself. Indeed, as if you were Christ himself. That's how Christ is yours. It is, he is all yours, and you may depend on it. See, this is what it means to have a proper grasp of the gospel that is of the overwhelming goodness of God. The overwhelming goodness of God, which neither prophet nor apostle nor angel was ever able fully to express and which no heart could adequately fathom or marvel at. This is the great fire of the love of God for us, whereby the heart and conscience become happy, secure, and content. There's a, there's, there's a certain kind of joy that Luther wants to emphasize. He, do, he, he doesn't believe that Christians should be long-faced and uh, somber and morose. There's a, there's a real joy um, to be found in the gospel. This is what preaching the Christian faith means. You, here you have the word preaching. Um, this is why such preaching is called gospel, which in German means a joyful, good and comforting message, a cheering message. So what then is the gospel, since there is and there was so much misunderstanding about the meaning of that word? We all use it, but do we really use it in the same sense? Luther says, at its briefest, the gospel is a discourse about Christ, that he is the Son of God and became man for us, that he died and was raised that he has been established as a Lord over all things. And the gospel in that sense can be very short or it can be very long. But what is crucial here is the for us. Uh, and in this, Luther echoes the Nicene Creed, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was crucified also for us. Uh, this is pretty important because you can tell people about Jesus, but unless you emphasize the for us-ness of Jesus, then Christ is only an example. He is never a gift. He becomes, again, yet another somebody we need to measure up to and probably will fail. And in that sense, Luther says, um, uh, there's a danger of creating hypocrites. So the gospel is a story about Christ, but with the important qualification that, that it is a story that all he has done is for us. So let me draw a couple of implications from um, all this. Uh, first of all, implications for biblical interpretation, uh, because you can see Luther in this autobiographical piece, really, I mean, he knows the scriptures, and yet he doesn't believe that he knows them rightly. You can know them inside out, and yet sort of make of the scriptures anything but um, the kind of book that they are meant to be. The first implication is that scripture even though it is the Word of God in its entirety, it's not all gospel. It is shot through, you might say, with the gospel. And quite a lot of the gospel is actually in the Old Testament. Luther emphasizes that very explicitly, especially in the Messianic promises. The Old Testament is shot through with the gospel. So what this means is that not every exposition of Scripture is preaching the gospel. Not every time we look at the Scriptures and exposit them, uh, not all of that is automatically gospel. It might be an exposition of the Word of God, but it need not be yet the exp an exposition of the gospel. But Luther is even more adamant. If your exposition of the scripture, Scriptures does not have the gospel in view, it is not even a faithful exposition of the Scriptures because it fails to recognize how God wants to be recognized. 
So even when we interpret those parts of scriptures that are not necessarily gospel, we must have, Luther would say, the gospel in view, because that's ultimately how God wants us, wants us to recognize Him in His walk with His people Israel, and then uh, His uh, culmination, His bringing, uh, rounding off of that history in the history of uh, Jesus Christ and the, and the church. The gospel for Luther is the key to the scriptures. The gospel itself is our guide and instructor in the scriptures, he says. So even when we exposit those parts which are not gospel, parts that have to do, say, with moral instruction, we had better keep the gospel in view, Luther believes. Otherwise, no matter how close you are to the text, you're not faithful to the scriptures. So what then is preaching the gospel? What then is the preaching of the gospel? And this is what Luther says, the preaching of the gospel is nothing else than Christ coming to us or we being brought to Him. It's the bestowal of Christ as a gift. And I think there is, uh, to my mind, no, uh, in a sense, more beautiful and simple expression of the meaning of the gospel than that African-American spiritual in the morning when I cry, give me Jesus. It's the bestowal of Christ or us being brought to Christ. Let me draw, so this is scriptural interpretation. Uh, let me draw a couple of implications for preaching um, from this picture that we have outlined so far. Um, interestingly enough, and this is uh, maybe a bit of a... <laughs> um, uh, a, 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 bit of, a bit of trivia, um, Luther thinks that the first preacher was the serpent in the garden. He was the preacher of a false god, of a god who was no good because he was not good. Um, the serpent was the first preacher who undermined the trust of the man and the woman. God is no, god is no good because he is not good. Did God really say? Okay, well, even if He did, did He really mean it? Now, when we preach, Luther believes the ultimate point of all of our preaching is to emphasize what he calls the overwhelming goodness of God. That goodness of God that comes to us in Christ, the bestowal of Jesus, giving of Jesus um, to the ones who are disturbed um, and, uh, and afflicted. We need to preach God's human face turned towards us. We need to preach God's self-giving. That's ultimately what the preaching of the gospel is. So ultimately, what we preach is justification. And what I mean by that is that we indicate in our preaching that God has already made more of us than we could ever make of ourselves. God has justified us. We make sense in His eyes. He has given us a place, a home to belong. Um, he has, he has uh, interpreted us the way we should be interpreted. And this justification, in a sense, was already evident. This divine justification was already evident for Luther um, in God's creation. God, we were literally nothing when God created us. He created us not out of need, but by sheer grace, by His overwhelming goodness, and He gave us a place and an identity. He made sense of us. He put us where we made sense. He put us where we belonged. He justified us. We were not out of place. But already in creation, you have kind of a foundational act of justification. God makes something of us and He makes more of us than we could ever make of ourselves. In creation, we were literally nothing. Um, as sinners, we too are nothing. Um, and yet, God makes more of us than we could ever make um, of ourselves. Now, how does that work? Um, the gospel for Luther has kind of a foundational um, character of promise. And here, um, uh, I need to emphasize that when we preach um, the gospel, we are not preaching about justification. Um, my, uh, my internship super supervisor many, many years ago said to me, uh, 
Don't preach about justification, justify the people. Preach in such a way that they receive Christ. Preach in such a way um, that they are sort of told about who they are and what they are, even if they don't see that yet in their own uh, selves. So don't preach about justification, justify the people. And the gospel justifies precisely by offering us Christ and making more of us than we could ever be, that we could ever make of ourselves. Sure, we don't see that now. We don't see that yet. Very often we struggle with our own, with our own self, our own old Adam, if you like. But uh, let me give you an analogy, and some of you have probably heard me uh, give this analogy before. Um, if you believed, and you shouldn't, if you believed that I was trustworthy, and that in a, a, a <laughs> and and a year from now I was I was going to give you a million dollars. If you believe that I could be trusted with this sort of promise, I'm going to give you a million dollars a year from now. I can guarantee that already today you're going to live like a millionaire. You're going to go to the bank and get a loan and get a car because you know that that million is coming your way a year from now. That's in a sense. I, I think it's a you know. All analogies are, in a sense, imperfect, but that's exactly sort of what the, what the preaching of the gospel aims to do. It tells us that despite of what we see in ourselves, we are much more than we could already make of ourselves, and we have the freedom to live into that. That's the power of the promise, that when, when a promise is, is trusted, when a promise is sort of grasped, it alters our life um, Altogether, there is a certain kind of freedom, and, that, and that's certainly true of human, and should be true of human promises, except we are not trustworthy. Um, we don't always live up to our word. But uh, when we give Jesus and tell people that in Christ they are already so much more than they could ever make of themselves, um, there is a certain kind of freedom that happens already in the moment. We can live into that, uh, and that promise is certainly more than a million dollars. So... My final implication for preaching, what we aim at with preaching is the creation and sustenance, the nourishing of faith. And here you can already see that faith is not just belief in God. I believe there is a God, well, so what? Faith is not just believing certain, Christ, certain, certain uh, things about Jesus as if you were ticking boxes off. But faith is rather taking God at His word. That He is over against this satanic doubt that He is no good because He is not good. Faith trusts that what God has done is truly for us. It takes God at His word. Um, and in that sense, faith is also being able to receive yourself from God's hands. Faith is able to receive yourself as the kind of self that you are in Christ, as the kind of self that possesses all that Christ has and has given to you. And in that sense, faith renews and sets the old person aside, sets the old Adam aside. When we take God at His word that we are indeed more than we could ever make of ourselves and that it is all ours and it's coming our way, uh, there is great liberation from that. And that is really the essence, the essence of faith. Uh, as I receive myself from God, as I receive myself in Christ, I can let the old self die. That's why Luther is such a strong, in the footsteps of Paul, such a strong preacher of freedom, a preacher of joy, and a preacher of the freedom of conscience. He apparently, I think, is the first uh, person to ever use that phrase, freedom of conscience. But he doesn't mean it in the way that we mean it. it he basically, he, he means it in the sense that um, I don't have to worry about myself. God's got my back. God has already made more of me than I could, already, uh, than I co uh, than I could ever make of myself. And in Christ, I am already everything I could possibly be. And therefore, my conscience is free from this uh, morbid self-preoccupation. Let me say a couple of things. Um, and hopefully we'll have a, a few minutes for, for questions, um, about then what is not gospel. Christ, Luther says, if you divide Christ's person from your own, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a typo there. If you divide Christ's person from your own, you are in the law. You remain in it and live in yourself, which means 
that you are dead in the sight of God and damned by the law. If you don't trust that God has already made something of you, uh, Luther says, you must justify it your own self. You must make something of yourself. You must, we are these kind of creatures who feel like we are sort of um, more than mere chance, and yet sort of we are not necessary. We, we, who am I? What am I? Uh, the plight of the sinner is constant self-justification. I must make sense of myself. I must, in a sense, underwrite my own um, existence. Luther calls that blessing yourself with your own works because that's the only way we can really do it. Um, it is by doing that we try to make something of ourselves. And um, you can see that in our resume and CV-oriented culture, right? Because it's on, 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 the C on your CV, you probably don't begin by saying united to Christ. Um, <laughs> You say, you list your accomplishments, and that's sort of what you are, um, but you also know that there's a number of other accomplishments or, or maybe things that you want to live down that you don't necessarily list on your, um, on your CV. And so, in a, in a sense, all, all that existence for Luther has the character of law. He means, he means law in a much broader sense than simply Old Testament law. Uh, it's, it's that which we must do. If we don't trust that God has done it, then we must do things, and, and it, has a, it has a character of compulsion. It has a character of law, and in doing that, we actually will also hijack God's own law. Um, but that means... Um, uh, but if we, if we use God's own law to justify ourselves, so not in the way it was meant to be used... Um, that means that we must bear the burden of keeping all of it. But there is also a contradiction. Even if we were able to keep, all, to keep God's law in order to justify ourselves, to make something of ourselves, if you like, um, it would still involve us in a contradiction. Because how can I really love the neighbor when by loving the neighbor I'm really loving myself? How can I use the, use the law that is supposed to take me out of myself purely for my own sake? So for Luther, uh, it's not even the burden of the law but even if some, somehow counterfactually we were able to keep it all, it, we would still not be keeping it because you cannot keep it um, for your own sake. It's not meant to be like that. It's meant to take you out of yourself. Um, so with all that, Luther says that the exi our existence in the law is really kind of our existence as holy hypocrites. Uh, I love that phrase from Luther. Um, it basically means that all of us are ultimately putting on a persona. We all want to appear better in the face of others, um, and perhaps even in the face of God, but then we can't really get away with it uh, before God. Um, what Luther wants to say is that the law, and that could be understood as Old Testament law, but even more than that, this existence in the law, when I must do something, he says, it is never meant to be a source of identity. Um, it can be an expression of our identity, but we can never make something of ourselves by means of it. Now, Luther believes that it's important to preach the law or to use it theologically. But this kind of theological use of the law for Luther is, um, is also a spiritual use. Because very often, when people hear the law, Luther thinks, they actually believe that they can keep it. Uh, and they become these holy hypocrites. But when the, law is really, um, when, it, when the law really comes as a vehicle of the Spirit, Luther says, the law does nothing but accuse consciences and manifest sin. All the law can do is to render us naked and guilty. Um, that's about as far as it goes. Um, the law, when we preach it theologically and the Spirit speaks through it, shakes us out of our attempted self-possession out of making something of myself by means of it. It disturbs and destabilizes our, our very being only to make us yearn for wholeness. But that wholeness can only come from the gospel because in the gospel we already are totally sound and whole and healthy. So a couple of concluding remarks. What we want to do when we preach for Luther um, in a sense, can be encapsulated uh, with, this, with these um, 
uh, slogans that he also uses, oratio, meditatio, tentatio. Um, prayer, meditation, and struggle. Luther says the proper subject, and that's on your handout, the proper subject of theology, that's what we want to, what we want to get where we want to get to, is man guilty of sin and condemned. It's the recognition that we cannot possess ourselves, that we destroy ourselves, that we become hypocrites when we try to possess ourselves, and so on and so forth, when we try to be creators of ourselves and simultaneously material. Um, so the proper subject of theology is man guilty of sin and condemned. That's where we want to get people in our preaching. That's where we want to get, pe get people to. And then God, but not just any God, but God, the justifier and savior of man, the sinner. And Luther can, can be pretty strong. He can be very hyperbolic. Uh, in this particular context, he adds, whatever is asked or discussed in theology outside this subject is error, is error and poison. Um, and he also says that it is a great and difficult art to fix our eyes only on the steadfast love of God and his abundant mercy. You would think that that was the simplest sort of thing to preach, God is good. But very often, um, and I think very often when people preach that, it basically means that God stays out of your business. But that's not how we want to preach the goodness of God. Uh, God is good because He actually wants you. He wants to give Himself to you. He doesn't want to leave you indifferent. And in that sense, it's, 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 it's actually really difficult. Um, like I said, in Luther's own day, the difficulty lay in the fact that people were so obsessed with themselves, that they made every thought of God a thought about the self. And then instead of running to God, they ran to something like indulgence letters. Um, today, and I listed that on, on, your, uh, on your handout, I wrote this article a couple of years ago um, uh, for the anniversary, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, um, called Justified for Good, Luther, Luther's Message for Late Modern Times, uh, where, I, where I sort of say that I think today for us the challenge is also a challenge, how to preach the goodness of God, because we live in a world where nothing is good for good, where certain things have value for us, and they have very utilitarian value. They, they elevate us in the eyes of others, like your latest iPhone, but then you have to just as quickly throw them away so you don't become uncool. Um, how do we preach the abiding goodness of God in a world in which nothing is good for good and everything is disposable? Um, that's, that's, that's a real challenge. How do we drive that home? So if, you, if you're interested in how I unpack that notion, um, you can, you can check, that, uh, check out that article. Um, so I think the first thing that we do, both as preachers but also as the hearers of, um, of the Word of God, as both law and gospel, um, we must come before God in prayer. We must, we must orient ourselves, ourselves to God as the source of justification and salvation. That's sort of what we want to do with people. It's the oratio. Uh, the whole congregation, including the preacher, prays, and that prayer orients them towards God. Then meditation, paying attention, um, not making every thought of God into a thought about yourself, but really paying attention to what God is like, um, dwelling on God, leaving yourself behind, um, rather than using God. And then all of that in the, in the, in the service of tentatio, in the, ser in, the, in the service of struggle in face of temptation. Preaching for Luther equip, equips the Christian for struggle. Um, and what I mean by that is perhaps uh, best illustrated by what I don't mean by that. So preaching is less about giving Christians something to ponder in the course of the week. Right? You don't preach just so people can go home and, and have something to, to, to think about. Um, no, you want to equip them for struggle. Um, you don't want to help them sort of become better versions of themselves, how they can sort of inscribe Jesus into their own story. No, it's about how they belong in Jesus' story. Um, I think that's, that's, that, that's the really important, uh, important contrast. And over against sort of unbelief, how can that be the case? Is that really the case? Did God really say? Um, so the goal of preaching is to help the Christian in battle with their old self-justifying self, with the world, and the demonic forces that move through it and seek to give the lie to God's goodness. And let me, let me wrap this up um, with this quotation from uh, two different sermons. Luther preached a, a sermon cycle on 1 Corinthians 15. 
Um, and what you will see here, and what I want to emphasize, and perhaps uh, what, I wanna, what I want you to sort of take into your own preaching strategies. Um, you know, everything that I've talked about so far is kind of the theological foundations of preaching. Um, but, what, uh, but you will see in just a moment that for Luther, this becomes real when, uh, when his sermons are, are sort of dialogical. Like he, Luther tries to in, uh, involve his congregation in the drama, and his understanding of equipping them for this sort of struggle with the self, the world, and the satanic forces that move through it is by teaching people how to respond. Uh, so Luther will actually switch in the course of his sermons to the, th to the first person, um, literally uh, equipping people with actual responses to what you should say, even if it's just in your own mind, um, to, uh, 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 in a situation where temptation comes. So his sermons are replete with dialogue. And that's very, that's very different from just sort of a midrash on a biblical text. There's, there's something very dramatic in how, in, in how these sermons are, um, are uh, conveyed. So listen to this, uh, and it's a, sort of a longer quote, and then if, if any of you have time to linger for questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Luther says, Christ came forth alive from the grave, in which he lay and destroyed and consumed both devil and death who had devoured him. He tore the devil's belly and hell's jaws asunder and ascended into heaven, where he is now seated in eternal life and glory. This is to be comfort and defiance, for on his name we are baptized and we hear and profess his word. After him we are called Christians. And for his sake, we suffer every misfortune and grief from the hand of the devil. We will therefore confront him confidently and say, No, you despicable, vile devil. You will not bring matters to such a pass that I surrender baptism and the name of my Lord for your sake. If you can defiantly rely on and make an uproar with your death, fire, water, pestilence, and hell, we can defiantly rely on this Lord Jesus Christ, who has vanquished you. He can again destroy you and cast you into hell eternally. And he, in fact, will do, and rest us alive from your jaws. Therefore, devour us if you can, or hurl us into the jaws of death. You will soon see and feel what you have done. We, in turn, will cause such a great disturbance in your belly and make an egress through the ribs that you wish you had rather devoured a tower, yes, an entire forest. For you previously consumed a person and put him under the ground, but he was too strong for you. To your great disgrace, you had to return him, although you blasphemed defiantly. He saved others. He cannot save himself. But now he defies you in return. He has become your death and hell, and soon he will overthrow you completely through us on the day of judgment. Then Luther turns to the congregation again. We have a complete victory in Christ. Now, spiritually, by faith, when we believe the promise, but later also physically and visibly. Now a Christian must learn to apprehend this and to avail himself of it when the battle is joined and the law attacks him and tries to accuse him, when sin wants to slay him and thrust him into the jaws of hell, and when his own conscience tells him, you have done this and you have done that, you are a sinner and are deserving of death, then the Christian should answer confidently. It is unfortunately true that I am a sinner and that I have surely deserved death. So far you're right, but still you shall not condemn and slay me. Another who is named my Lord Jesus Christ shall stay your hand. You accused and you murdered him innocently. But do you remember how you vainly dashed full tilt against him and burned yourself and thereby forfeited all your rights to me and to all Christians? For he both bore and overcame sin and death, not for himself, but for me. Therefore, I concede you no right, no rightful accusation against me. I can rather justly assert my rights against you for trying to attack me without cause and despite the fact that you were already condemned and overcome by him, which deprived you of any right to assail and accuse me. And although you may now attack and devour me according to the flesh, 
You shall not accomplish or gain anything by this. You must eat your own sting and choke to death on it. For I am no longer the man you are looking for. I am no longer, I am no longer a child of man, but a child of God. For I am baptized in his blood and on his victory, and I am vested with all his possessions. Um, really pretty dramatic, and uh, uh, you know these are these are very lengthy um, uh, responses. But um, I don't know whether Luther changed his voice when he preached like that. But there is a, but there, there 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 is a sense I think in which when the congregation listens, they are enveloped in the drama. But above all, they are taught not just about Christ, but they are taught Christ. They are given Christ, they, and they are given the right kind of responses to to be themselves participants in this in this drama. So I leave you with that. Uh, again, if you want uh, to read more Luther, begin with the, or Luther the preacher, begin with the, with the Christmas book. Uh, it's really a very edifying and beautiful text, and then you might perhaps be interested in more. So thank you very much. Plus, Dr. Malwish. Thank you so much. Very good. Oh.